first speaker uh, today is uh, Bart Selman. He'll tell us about automated scientific discovery using insights from problem set. Okay, thank you. Um, so yeah, so this is this is joint work with with Scala Gomes, uh, Ronan LeBron, who's actually now at the uh, Paul Paul Ellen Institute uh, in Seattle, the AI Institute, Stefan uh, Stefano Ermann, and currently at Stan now at Stanford, and Yezhan uh, Shu, who will uh, finish up uh, next year in our group. So, oops. Um, so the, the work started by, uh, by uh, you know, I've, I've done a lot of work on inference, a lot of work on satisfiability solvers. Uh, and we want to use these, these tools uh, for, for scientific discovery. Um, and, you know, partly motivated that that's sort of the, you know, the, one of the key outstanding challenges in, in AI. Uh, but it's also a very interesting problem. So, um, so I'll be talking today mainly about work in, we did in, in finite, in discrete mass, finite mathematics. Um, we have other work in, in, in a little more practical in materials discovery where we, uh, where we synthesize new materials for fuel cells and for uh, renewable energy. Uh, but I actually won't, won't cover that just to not be too long. So, oops. So um, in the early days, actually, of, of automated theorem proving, there, there was a lot of optimism uh, about, you know, actually just first order logic theorem provers. So, so in the 1960s, uh, when resolution was discovered, uh, uh, first automated techniques for, for, for uh, first order logic inference, the idea was that we soon would be proving interesting theorems in mathematics uh, just by translation to first order logic and, and, and running the, the solvers. Uh, it is actually it was disappointing, I guess. So people discovered uh, it, it really uh, it really doesn't work. Uh, the language, um, first of logic, in a certain sense, is too powerful. Uh, although you might not think, if you're a logician, you don't think first of logic is too powerful. But for a inference procedure, it's too powerful. It's too general. So if you look at, at uh, you know, even proving simple. Uh, uh, theorems in about number theory or something like that, uh, basic theorems that, that, that humans prove easily, uh, theorem provers cannot do yet. Uh, and and may, may still take a long time. Uh, if you look at sort of the details, what goes wrong is just the search space is too unconstrained. So, the, so the, your first order logic theorem prover will search part of the, of the search space with resolution that has nothing to do with your theorem or will not get you at all towards your theorem. Uh, so it, it doesn't work, OK? Uh, and it took people maybe 20, 30 years to realize what the issue was. Uh, and you know, uh, so actually, so, so what we actually, so what did become successful is, is satisfiability solving, propositional reasoning, because it's somewhat more constrained. Uh, mm -hmm. The language is more constrained, and the search space is, is easier to handle, OK? Um, I'll just give you a quick mention of some of the things that, that were discovered. It wasn't a total failure. Some things were, were interesting. Um, and, um, and, and so that, that's, that's one thing I'll talk about briefly. Um, I'll also stress that we're interested in, in true discovery, in the sense of discovering a new theorem, a new result. Uh, there's quite a bit of work on, 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 uh, in the theorem proving community on, on, on interactive theorem proving or uh, proving theorem, reproving theorems that are known. Uh, it's hard to judge, for me, it's hard to judge that work because you know, things get engineered into the solving procedure to, to get you to the result. So, so to say it's automatically discovered this or that becomes hard to judge. If you find something new, what we'll do here, um, we couldn't build it in because we didn't know what it was looking for. So. Yeah. So, uh, um, this, is, this uh, field is new to me and very, oh. very interesting. But no. is, like, discovering new primes, big primes, mm -hmm. is that called uh, automatic? Uh, discovering new primes. I guess you could call that uh, new. So, yeah. So, um, I mean, it's a, it's a spectrum of sort of, you know, more towards calculation and known procedures. I, I would say it's discovery, but not as surprising. Two words like you know, uh, proving an open theory in, in group theory or something. Yeah. So, so you probably get to this, but previously unknown, interesting results. Interesting. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And again, interesting is on the scale of how interesting. Yeah. You can you can judge. Yeah. So yeah, we hope to make it very interesting, but of course it's not easy. Um, so here, just just going back. Uh, 
memory lane. Well, uh, so 1976, the, the, sort of the first real, uh, I think, computer proof, uh, where, where computers were used uh, to prove a, a, an interesting open problem, the four-color theorem uh, of, of calling a uh, planar map as four color, colors. Uh, I, I'm characterizing, and this is a very rough characterization. So, you know, you know how you know how useful was the computer in that setting? Uh, and you know, I, m I made up these numbers. So, uh, you know, Hagen was was a, a, an Apple. Where they were specialists in the area, and they actually built on previous proof techniques. Uh, and in the end, they ended up you know ha using the machine to to, to basically you know, uh, analyze you know, about two thousand special submaps. Okay, uh, but what submaps they had to analyze, that was invented by them, so, uh, or even by previous people. So, so the machine did some work, uh, but it was sort of approved by cases and, and sort of almost a checking kind of thing. Uh, it was very, quite controversial and probably still controversial in the math world, mathematics world. It's, it's accepted, it has been replicated. Um, it's it's in it's not elegant from the mass perspective because you know the, the, the two thousand cases don't give any further insights about why the theorem is true uh, and we still don't know uh, we, we still we still don't have a more profound proof um, also it had to be done several times because even the you know the programs checking uh, the cases. Uh, would technically have to be proved correct himself, and that's that's never actually done. I think, although it's now being replicated, I think in in the interactive theorem prover. So so now it's being re replicated. Uh, but there's sort of various problems with that in the sense that when your program says this this is correct, you know, do you know your program is correct? Okay, so so there's several drawbacks <coughs> you have to deal with. Uh, but overall, I would say it still wasn't was an example of uh, of automated theorem proving. In, uh, to, to prove something interesting, okay. um, a more a little bit more obscure, 1996 Roman's algebra uh, showing that a certain set of axioms that was proposed for for, for Boolean algebras uh, was complete. Uh, this was actually uh, oops, um, I think more interesting from a, from a computational perspective. This was really only about 30 percent human, 70 percent machine. Uh, very clever rewriting of axioms, and, and, and you know, mathematician had actually worked on, on exactly that strategy for many years and couldn't find how to do that. Uh, and what's interesting is that, that the, the final theory, the final proof, is, <coughs> is actually sort of a, a one-page proof of the intermediate steps. And it can, in principle, you can follow it as a mathematician that these are the correct proofs to take, um, the, the correct steps to take. Uh, does it provide insights in the overall theorem? It's a little more arguable. Uh, it's sort of a magic thing that if you do these rewrites, you'll get to the, the to, you complete your proof. Uh, um, but it is semi-human readable, as I say. Um, so that was was a bit of an advance. Um, next one. Uh, this is a very reasoned one, and I actually find it quite exciting. If you if you want to dig into this area, you should you look this one up. You might have read about it. Uh, uh, Erdos discrepancy problem. Um, so very, very easy to state. We have a sequence of plus ones, minus ones. It goes on arbitrary long. Uh, and you start looking at the summation of the sequence. So the simplest summation is just the sequence itself, plus one, two, one, two. So it goes up and down uh, if you sum them up. And you keep track of that sum, OK? Uh, now, that sum by itself is not so interesting, so you start looking at uh, subsequences of the sequence. So step starting by two, four, uh, six, and you sum over that subsequence. Then you do the subsequence three, six, nine. All arithmetic progressions as subsequences. And again, you look at uh, how, you know, how high up and down does that sum go? Okay. So uh, what Erdos um, proposed, or the Erdos uh, conjecture was, that that if you make this sequence long enough. Um, there's no way to, to keep the bounds, to keep it between, you know, let's say plus two or minus two. Okay? At some point, uh, it will burst out of that bound. Uh, and, and in fact, the, the general conjecture is it will get, up, if you go arbitrary long, you know, all subsequences at some point, or each, there will always be some subsequence that breaks out of the bound so that the you put. The quantifiers out for every infinite sequence, there exists a subsequence that, that the sums are unbounded. 
Yes, 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 yes. You should be up there, I guess. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So uh, what's surprising about this, at least to me it was surprising, for, for, the, for the bounds of uh, plus one and minus one, you can actually by hand find, I think you can't go beyond six, I guess, then seven is already uh, reached a problem. For the bound of plus two, minus two, it was open, okay? It was open till two years ago. Uh, and there was actually a polymass project uh, by people, you know, amateur mathematicians, but real mathematicians, uh, searching even to answer the question for two. Um, and part of the problem with, with plus two minus two is that, that you can start looking for sequences that work, and people found surprisingly long sequences. They found sequences of 100, 200, 300. Uh, they used computer code programs to search. They couldn't find the violating sequence, okay? So uh, it actually stopped uh, around 2012. People sort of said, well, we, we, we can't make real progress. They, they made some progress. A lot of interesting work was done, the building on previous, uh, on different types of sequences from coding theory that have special properties about discrepancy. You know, this kind of sequences are interesting for coding theory <laughs> to keep you, how, how, how regular or, or how pseudo-random can you construct a sequence that, that satisfies, that, that keep the discrepancy low. That's what you want to have. Uh, but anyway, it was sort of stopped until somebody, uh, this was in, uh, uh, ah, so this is just a statement. Okay. Yeah. So, so this is until in, in I think, the, yeah, 2014, okay, uh, uh, Lich, uh, Lysitsa and, and Kodev encoded as a satisfiability problem and just downloaded a, a SAT solver. And they found um, that uh, if the sequence, uh, that you have to go quite long, 1161 is the, is the first sequence, so that there always exists a subsequence that goes out of bounds. In fact, they also found a sequence of 1160 elements that stays within the bound. So for the case of, of, of a discrepancy of two, it was just it was resolved in 2014 by a SAT solver. And this work, you know, I would say it took them a, you know, two weeks. I actually replicated it on, on my Mac. It's, it, it's now a homework assignment in my course. It, it, it runs in two hours. You can find this sequence, or actually one hour on the MacBook Pro, you find this sequence. In 10 hours, you prove that no longer one exists, okay? And, uh, and it took, I would say, it took the set solvers that were developed about two or three years ago. It's not, it's really, it's just possible, okay? Um, let me see. Uh, so th this is like, so it, actually the encoding is fairly, so I wouldn't, that would barely, it's barely 10% human, okay? Um, what I find really interesting about this result is, is again, is this case that no longer subsequence exists. Because basically what you're, we're gonna, uh, I'll show you this sequence in a moment, but um, this result saying no, is one of these cases where you run your theorem prover for 10 hours, uh, it's about 10 hours, uh, the, the sequential version, and it will just print out unset, okay? Which, unsatisfiable, uh, meaning uh, I cannot find a sequence that stays within the bounds. Uh, it's somewhat unsatisfactory because what if there's a bug in your program or in these, these solvers are actually hugely complex nowadays, you know, thousands of lines of code. Uh, so you don't really know. What's nice here is it will print out the proof trace. Yeah. Now you might say 13 gigabyte is a little long, um, <laughs> but that's old, old school thinking. Um, these steps are very simple. So, so these are just A implies B given A Next line, B. Um, B implies, and C implies D. Uh, next, you know, every step is a simple modus ponens steps of the previous, of some previous steps. Super simple. So you can actually write your own proof checker, or you can download one, which is like 20, 30 lines of code. Download the proof, and you check every step, and you'll be convinced. I think that's a reasonably secure, like a reasonably certain real proof. So it's no longer you have to trust, you can forget about how the theorem prover found that proof, and without the SAT solver you could never find it. But once you have that proof and you can actually download it from their website, uh, you can check it, yeah. It actually leads to the question of, of hierarchy, because maybe now I need to check the proof checker, maybe it's not a simple proof checker, and then I will have to check the next one and so on. Yeah, if, in terms of the, the proof checkers, yeah, yeah. So in, and, and in this case, a proof checker is really like 20 lines of code, but yeah, it can become more inter more, more intrigued, yeah, yeah. So, uh, uh, but I think it's, it's an important step for people thinking of, of using uh, SAT solvers and theorem proving. You don't have to, you don't have to say in the end, like, oh, you have to trust my SAT solver. Uh, you don't, you know, you throw the SAT solver out, here's the proof, write your own checker and, and do it. So, so yeah. 
So for proving uh, uh, the 1161... Uh, yeah. Does not exist, yeah. Are there like 1161 variables? And what is it like for every... Yeah, one? every setting. So 2 to the 1161 sequences are carefully <laughs> checked. Yeah, yeah. And, and of course, you can, as I tell my class, 2 to the 1161 is 10 to the 350. That's not being done. How many, uh, how many inference steps it takes is about 10 billion. 10 to the 10, 10 to the 11. So this is yeah. also the one that yeah. Tau solved, right? I'll come to that. Yes, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So just to follow up on that first okay. question, um, so there wasn't anything non-trivial done with the encoding to SAT? It was pretty straightforward? Very straightforward, very straight. Yeah, that's not an issue. Like, you have to formulate that encoding. So there you also want to be sure that that encoding is very transparent. Yes, and that's important, yeah. Uh, and, and yeah, so so yeah, so Terence, so after this was done, so Terence Towns was involved in the original polymass project. Um, th there are some other things that came out of this work about multiplicative subsequences and, and special kinds of, of sequences. Uh, and Terence Tao, uh, you know, a year later, used a very deep result, uh, which I find too hard to explain, uh, from another area to actually prove the general conjecture. So, so he, he cleaned up the area and said, okay, now the, the full conjecture is proved. Uh, so that's an amazing result. I still think that that was partly, uh, the, the, the multiplicative subsequence which I want to discuss was, was discovered in this type of work. So, so I think Therostanz used a little bit of those insights, um, but did much deeper math, much more general. So, um, but still, this was the first one for the cases two, okay? Which was surprising was open. So, um, so yeah, actually, yeah, okay. Let me actually show you. So let me. So what I'm saying. So each of the results I just mentioned, uh, inside, you know, gives some insight in the underlying problem structure of the domain. Uh, but but there's still work to be done. Uh, and uh, and what my talk is about here is, you know, we find these complex objects. So so let's say there there are two issues. One is if if, if the sequence exists. Can you actually understand what is the structure of that particular solution? What is, what is underlying the structure? Uh, so I'll show you that sequence in a moment. Uh, um, you know, can we describe it? So that's what this talk is about. The other, the other side would be to take that 14 or 18 gigabyte proof and understand the structure of that proof. Th that's another problem, and, and I won't talk about it, but I think it's very exciting. I think there is structure in that proof and we probably can understand it, and we can discover new mass if we start understanding, analyzing these proofs, okay? Um, here's the thing. <laughs> so here's the, the, the 1160 sequence, um, and all I want to stress about it, so if you, if you look at all the subsequence, all the sum, everything stays within two, um, so, and this is the longest possible. Um, and, and so in general, you know, what, what am I going to talk about is, you know, I'd like to understand this better. Now, we don't understand this one better um, because it's, we just started looking at that one and, and it was only recently discovered. Uh, but but, but there, there presumably is some structure here that would actually allow us, for example, as computer scientists, to find a little constructive procedure to generate a sequence. We just don't know what it is. Okay, um, yeah. So when you say subsequence, this is meaning you have to start from the beginning and just do every second or every third. It's not yeah. like... Yes. Not intervals for sub intervals or sub, you know, pieces within the overall sequence. No, no, no. It's it's starting literally starting at the beginning. So the subsequent steps of two starts at two, four, six, and the, these are homogeneous uh, arithmetic and, and expressions. And one, three, five, seven also counts as a subsequence. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, actually, one, three, five, seven. No, no, no. It actually has it. It has to, it has to start again, multiple, multiple starting at zero. Starting at zero. Yeah, yeah. So homogeneous. Okay. There's actually results on on these other kinds of subsequences, and actually, I think it's the results are slightly easier to prove. For other, this is the hard case. Um, the other ones are easier to obtain. Um, so okay, so so you know that, that just if you say well you know what's this talk about? It's it's about you know moving beyond uh, you know just getting solutions uh, and witnesses. Try to find the structure in those witnesses. Okay, um, and we were able to do that for another type pro of problem, um, and I just have to introduce that. Uh, it's called the spatially let uh, balanced Latin square problem. Uh, it's it's uh, you know coloring problem or or you know, this is the multiplication table of a quasi group, um, and we have six different colors. And what we want is we want a, 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 you know no repetition of colors in any row or in any column. Um, 
that gives us a, a quasi group, a multiplication variable of quasi group, or just a Latin square. Uh, but we have one more condition. So constructing those is easy. Uh, quasi groups you, you can generate easily. Um, it's actually very nice results on Markov chains that generate sample from quasi groups. Uh, but we have a, a, a much tougher constraint here. Uh, Average column-wise pair of symbols, in, okay, it's, it has a balanced structure. And let me show you the next slide because it's easy, it's clearer. Okay, here. So here's a spatially balanced uh, Latin square of order six. So it's a Latin square, so every color, if you would check carefully, there's no repetition in any color in row, uh, of any color in any row or column. Okay, that's, that's the first thing. That's, that's the easy thing to do. The second thing is much harder. So we're looking at every pair so I have a few pairs of colors, but all possible pairs are up here. Uh, but here are just a few examples, red and green. And for each row, I write the distance down, OK? <coughs> this, they're next to each other distance one. We call this one. These are four apart. There's three in between. So for, you know, call four apart, um, two apart, three, et cetera. So we, we write for this, uh, in every row, we write down the distance of this pair. We add them up. And we get, and you can divide it by the number of rows, you get an average distance, okay? But you can also just look at the sum, okay? Now, what's remarkable about this construction is you look for every coloring pair, and you add up these guys, they have to add up to the same number. In this case, they all add up to 14, okay? So, they're carefully balanced in terms of the average distance of, of all possible colors, pair of colors, okay? Uh, now, you might say, why? Uh, why do you care about this? Well, this is part of, you know, the problem came, actually, this is Carla Gomes, actually, in computational sustainability, got this problem from people working uh, in agriculture, doing, doing uh, we have it, yeah, yeah. Uh, New York State, uh, to, to test uh, fertilizers. They run experiments on different plots of lands. And to do these experiments, you want to limit the, cor you, you want to take away, uh, you know, you want to deal with correlations as well as possible. And so you want to actually sort of have the different experiments at different distances, all possible different distances, in a balanced way. So it's part of what's called the, the field of experimental design. Uh, and so it leads to these very hard, you know, combinatorial design problems um, to run an actual experiment on virtualizers or whatever kind of statistical experiment you want to do. Uh, and so it takes care of correlations properly. Okay. So uh, six by six or so. And actually, I think when Carla got involved, this was also the largest known one. Okay. It was not easy to find when these were found. This one was, this one I think you can still find by hand. Don't, don't ask me how they found it. Uh, it's a tough one. Uh, but Carla got involved in actually generating them. So, uh, so here, um, you know, once he got involved in, I guess, 2004, um, here's another Selman. You see, it's slightly misspelled, but, uh, but it's good for my scholar count. Okay, so, um, yeah, so constraint programming. Uh, we hired them as a postdoc. It was quite confusing. Um, so order nine, they found, yeah, after, after using constraint, basically as a search problem. Uh, and uh, this is a local search problem. You see it going up a bit, and then the time was fast. Uh, and now streamlining, I'm going to get to that, composition-based streamlining. Uh, the largest they could do streamlined local search, a very specialized kind of local search. They could do order 35, 35 by 35, uh, 1.2 million seconds. Um, that's sort of where they stopped uh, and said, well, so we can find some of these larger ones. And actually, some there's actually a little startup. <laughs> this is weird. There's a little startup company actually selling uh, these designs now. Uh, to, 35, yeah, 35, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Every, row has every row has to be uniquely, yeah, yeah. yeah. All the in the row. Yeah, yeah, so all the colors, and, and we just use numbers, I guess, yeah. So, um, Is there an existence proof? Do, do, do these things always exist for, with a pair condition? Um, what is now known is that for certain orders, you can prove it doesn't exist. And we have, well, what we'll get to is construction that for other orders, we can actually construct them now. But now I'm giving away the main. <laughs> Point. <laughs> so yeah, 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 yeah. So a lot more we've known now. Okay. So um, here. So th uh, 300 hours of CPU. So this was the solution uh, of, of 330 hours of CPU time, completely balanced, uh, valid Latin square. Uh, I always say, I hope that, I, that we verified that. Um, and now, so here, uh, now we can generate guys like this uh, in under a millisecond. Uh, this is what this talk is about. Uh, so we can do you know, 10K by 10K in a few seconds. So, so now we can just generate whatever we want. 
For, for certain, not for all orders, but for certain orders with some properties. Uh, uh, but we can go arbitrary large. Um, and, and so, but just to go back, you know, when we saw this, you know, we thought, well, there, there has to be something about this, these problems. And actually, my claim in the end is like things like, like uh, Ramsey numbers and all these kind of interesting problems from, from discrete uh, finite mathematics. We believe that, that, you know, that there are constructions for, for the cases when, when the objects exist. We just don't know what the constructions are. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's hidden in, in, in the solutions. Now, when people use SAT solvers, um, they just get solutions like this and then they say, okay, we're done. Okay, we want them to take the next step. What is the construction underlying a solution? Okay. Between a probabilistic proof and a, and a constructive. And a constructive, yeah. We want to we get to the constructive part, yeah. Um, and, and, you know, first, you know, before we started, we didn't know it existed, so, but, yeah. So, um, so how do you find a, a constructive, something to, to construct something like this? So, okay. Okay, so, um, so we've done the motivation. Okay, so now, now let me show how we found the, the construction. So, because that's, I think, the interesting part. Uh, so discovering problem structure and discovering, you know, I said actually problem solution structure. We're interested in the solutions of the problem and whether there's hidden structure in there. Um, and the key tool that we used is, is something that was used in, in, uh, uh, in SAT solving and uh, uh, in automated reasoning. It's called a tool that's called uh, streamlining. So the key behind a lot of uh, efficient reasoning. Why are these set solving so so powerful? Is the propagation mechanism? It's it's sort of you know you set a few variables that propagate through your formula. Then there is things like clause learning where you add inferred constraints during your search and you get more propagation. So I th but I would say 90 percent or maybe even 95 percent of all the work is done by very fast unit propagation. The problem is you want to increase that propagation. So. The conservative way of increasing the propagation is, is just to learn these new clauses and, um, and hope that you get more propagation. It works very well. That's why we're going to do million variable problems in hardware verification, software verification. Um, but streamlining takes us a step further. We're going to add constraints and we're going to cut parts of the search space off. That, those parts might have all the solutions, in which case we, we, we streamline to the wrong subproblem. But we're hoping that the streamlining, these extra constraints, are going to guide us to areas of the search space with very regular solutions. Uh, and we hope to find those. So let me. Um, ah, so, so, so we're actually sort of general claim here is when you do this kind of search, combinatorial search, you, you know, the, the tendency is we, we want to keep all possible solutions around. We want to be conservative. Um, what we're going to be here is non conservative. We're going to say, uh, yeah, keeping the full solution sets hidden in my constraints and keep looking for that might actually be very, maybe too hard. And we'll actually see that in this case, that's too hard. Uh, so we're actually going to cut down. Yeah. yeah in, in this context, do you know if like the uh, 1160 solution that you mentioned before, yeah. for example, is unique? For, for the length. Yeah, that's not unique. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's there's not there's not. Like if, if the solution is unique and yeah. you're like guiding your search in the wrong direction and you, Th yeah, then you like, lose very like quickly. Seven fifty, there are like yeah. zillion of solutions. Then. Then you go wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we well actually, although you know the process we're going to do is very incremental, so so we have to start in small instances. So we would so so the way although I'm not going to show it on the on the. Uh, discrepancy problem because we haven't done that yet, but we would start with smaller, uh, see, like sequence of 400, try to generate. Uh, so I guess my question is, is, do you think it's going to work even when the solution is unique, or is it just yeah, yeah. there yeah, yeah. abundance of solution, and therefore if you guide it, you're still going to find something? Yeah, so, so the, the, the structure that I'm giving is actually is exactly takes care of that. We're going to do this incrementally going to large and larger sizes, so even if the solution becomes unique, which it isn't quite for the airless problem, but even if it would be unique, this, this strategy still works. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, very good problem. So, um, okay, let me just, so I think we have, um, so, so we, the way I look at it is, um, you know, for, for integrated commentary problems, if solutions exist, there will often be some highly regular one. Can we find those? And can we get our search algorithm to find those? Okay, that's, that's the key thing. Uh, and, uh, so this is streamlined search overview. So, so you start with your, your you know, so it's, Conceptually, very you know, simple idea, but but surprisingly powerful. You start with your original uh, solution space, like you know, 
2 to the 1160 or some of that, a huge space. Uh, but you start uh, asserting some, co some condition, some constraint uh, on that solution space. Like, uh, you know, uh, and, and like you, you might have constraints that cuts off this little part uh, and say, I'm only going to look for solutions in the spatially balanced square that are symmetrical, for example. So pretty simple constraints. Now you're searching in the subspace, okay? And of course your hope is, I, mean, I have to do this process so that, that I, I, I keep having solutions in these subspaces. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, uh, let me, okay. A circle is called, we call it a streamliner. Uh, and it's a first, you know, and the streamlining condition is maintained during the search as a set of constraints and unit propagation uh, handles it and forces it quickly. So uh, it also has to be fast. Um, okay, uh, there's actually quite a bit of, of, of work. Uh, you know, how do you define uh, a streamliner as well? Human insights are used a lot, uh, but we want to actually move more to machine learning. And actually, some clause learning in SAT solving can actually be viewed as, as finding a certain streamliners. Uh, so it's, it's, yeah, these are too abstract to really make much sense of. Uh, so uh, let me skip over these, yeah. Um, let me just get to that. I'm also going to skip over this. So we have a general framework to find streamliners, but it's much easier just to see a little example. Um, so what we're doing at, at the high level is we start uh, with this is our set of streamlines initially empty, um, and we um, we start with small instances. Let's say and it's order three, three by three or four by four, uh, and generate uh, start with lowest order, and we generate solutions. Let me just see where that comes up. Yeah, we generate solutions. Okay, and then we look at these solutions, or if we have a machine learning approach, we, we we look for regularities using, uh, using, using some machine learning uh, method that looks for, for, for statistical regularities. We get our solution set, we, we find uh, some regularities, and we conjecture that there are solutions with those regularities, and we assert it to the solver. Okay? Um, then we strengthen this set. So let's say now we try, let's say we found symmetries in these solutions. Okay, it doesn't have to be all solutions. Just a subset of solutions has symmetries. I say, okay, maybe symmetries is, is something to enforce. So we enforce it, uh, and we strengthen it. Now we go to a larger size. Okay, and we try to solve this one. We get other solutions. Find new streamliners. Uh, Keep going. Now we might now and then uh, assert a set, if, if you actually uh, assert symmetric and, and cyclic, which is sort of like rotating the the, the columns. Uh, if you if you do them together, you actually you know you don't get any solutions. Uh, I think size six. Uh, so then you have to weaken. You have to throw out. And we actually, I think later on we throw out actually cyclic, uh, but here we throw out symmetric. So that set of of constraints actually grows and shrink, grows and shrink. Okay. Uh, okay. The key point is the next one. Um, so we have a whole setup where people explore, and, and this is what, what Ron and uh, LeBron uh, implemented, and it was a beautiful system where you can interact, and, and here you can actually you get example solutions. Here you can assert streamliners based on what you see, and then you go to the next slice and, and, and generate bigger ones. Okay? Um, I think what's most interesting is, that, is, the, is the final slide, is this table here. So, um, because this shows sort of what, what the real process is. So if you uh, don't assert any structure and no streamliners, <coughs> you can do <coughs> up to size six. We, we, we actually went fairly 60 seconds, but we could, you know, even, even if you do uh, hours, you can't find these kinds of solutions at all. So, so you actually, your computer search can just get to this, okay? Uh, but you start looking at, at these kind of solutions, and you see solutions that are symmetric, okay? Uh, so you assert that, and you get your new set of streamliners, okay? Now, you can suddenly generate, so you're, you're going to help your solver, because you're going to so find different, higher instances, and they're going to have this symmetric structure, and you look at those instances. And now, I won't go into the reduced means, you know, one of the columns is, is, is fixed in order, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, up to n. Uh, actually, the, the left column and the top row. Um, you start finding more and more structure. Then you, you assert the, the new structure, and you can, you, can, you, know, you can generate some more. In fact, in this case, we don't actually solve new ones, but we actually get new insights. We, we're focusing on a subset of solutions, okay? 
Look at a dozen new solution, you, 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 you assert those properties, and you can solve a little bigger, okay? Uh, then he's found one final properties, and I'm not explaining these properties in the paper, but these are interesting properties. Uh, and suddenly you can get up to, to size 14, okay? Um, so, so, so two things that, that, that are sort of important. Um, you, you can only find the larger, you, you couldn't find larger solutions if you didn't assert your initial structure. So the, the streamliners help the solver, okay? So there's a human there who... There's a human in the loop. Okay. For this one, there's a human in the loop. You know, we're now I working. I saw these squares. I didn't yeah. see any, uh, I mean, I don't know what... what, what oh, uh, any structure. Yeah. Yeah, you have, to, you have to stare at them a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we're, we're working on automating it. So that's, that's, the, that's the next step. But I think it actually is doable. Um, so... Uh, so actually, two, this refers to your, your comment. If you pick an arbitrary, so, so if I had to go back, uh, probably not a good idea, but if I do very quickly, uh, if, if I look at this guy, there's no way you're going to see the structure. This is a, a sort of almost a random solution, one of the solutions that the sets over five. I guess the door, maybe. This one? Or they are. Uh, anyway. So, um, this is a random solution. You couldn't actually find a structure in this problem. So, so one thing we are arguing here is you have to do this incrementally because you have to, to, to focus in on a special subset of solutions. And if you do it step by step, you will be guided to these special ones. And if you look at, at, at carefully at the details of these solutions, you, you will find the structure in them. Uh, and, but, but it has to be done incrementally. Okay, So... Um, streamlining reveals new general. So, so, so when you use the system, you actually have to go. This is sort of what mathematicians do, of course. They go small instances, large instances, large instances. It's a very natural process, but you actually have to go to that. Um, and then finally, what was us? Yeah, at, at size fourteen, you know, you, you, you get you see enough structure in your solutions that you actually can look at. Is there a constructive procedure? Okay, and yes, at size fourteen, that's that's happening. Uh, and I think it's best to look at this, at this one. So here's an example of a size uh, four, you know, 14 construction with all these streamliners. And you start seeing things happen. So this is asserted, actually. These are the, the, the regular structures asserted. 1, 2, to 14. Uh, the row, top row, and the top column are asserted. You can look at You can check the symmetry is there, everything. But what's more interesting is you start seeing some structure in how this gets discovered. Let's see. So 2, 4, 6, 8. So this goes in steps of 2 up to 14. And then it goes 13, 11, 9, it goes down, you see? So it's a, a month only increasing by, by constant steps and then goes down, okay? Similarly, this goes up steps of 3, then goes down, uh, 14, 11, 8, then goes up again, 5, or 5 and then it goes uh, 2, and then 1, 4, it goes up again. You, you see these sort of subsequences uh, with, with constant differences. So, so the second row has steps of 2, the steps of 3, steps of 4. It gets a little messy because you quickly get over, you know, steps of five, you know, five, ten, then you go fifteen, so you're already too high. So, so these subsidies become shorter and shorter, but you can sort of generalize. You say, wait a minute, maybe we can have a construction that starts creating these subsequences, and then, uh, you know, when it goes over n, you go do the subsequence down. Okay. So, and that actually is the procedure. Okay. Um, this is the, so, so it's actually not hard then to, to take this and generalize it and actually come up with, with a little you know, constructive procedure that will now generate patterns like this. And of course, for, for uh, arbitrary size, here's the constraints on size. 2n plus 1 has to be prime. Okay? So, so it doesn't work for all orders. But for any n where you, you know, uh, order n where, where 2n plus 1 is prime, it will generate it. Uh, and now you can do the next step. You can prove it correct. And that's a... That's a messy proof, uh, but it can be done. Okay. So now you have a construction of this object. Uh, and, and again, it's not, it's not fully automatic, but, but it, the, the search, the, the commentary search and the streamlining is essential to get the structure out. And, and we're now trying to integrate with more machine learning to, to conjecture streamliners. That's what you want to do. Um, and do it more automatic. We have one for that that does a sl that does a cyclic one. I, I remember I actually threw out the cyclic constraint early on, but you can do the same game in the cyclic one, and now the sequences are going vertically. So that's a second procedure to do it. Uh, so okay, and this is pretty much actually. Uh, so uh, incremental approach in terms of size is necessary. You need to reveal the structure by increasingly larger. So if you if you start too large, you won't find enough structure in the solution. Um, True solution comes uh, visible at some point. Uh, 
and um, and you know, and, and and sort of the streamlining is needed to even generate solutions. Otherwise, you couldn't get any solutions actually. Um, so we actually you know, conjecture that, that many computer design problems have affected yet to be discovered construction procedure, you know, quasi-group existence problems, code design, Ramsey graphs, and so, you know, uh, Eridos, I, I think, has a, so, you know, there's sort of an interesting anecdote how we never will know certain uh, Ramsey numbers. Uh, uh, I actually don't believe it. I think we will find constructive procedure doing this kind of work. Uh, so uh, very in intricate procedures, but still uh, constructive. But there's still some things we won't know, right? Like busy beaver numbers. There will be some things we don't know. Yes, <laughs> yes yeah, yeah. No, there will be something, but yeah. It raises a more general conjecture. Mm -hmm. because assume that I have a, a, a small description. So I have a formula of there exists an x such as phi of x and phi is short. Mm -hmm. yeah. and there exists of x less than t. Yeah. Does it imply that I will be able to generate such an example in size which is not exponential in t? Yeah. I mean, this is, I mean, this is a general structure here. Yeah, you yeah. have a small description. It's very small description, yeah. yeah, and, yeah. and then you want yeah. to be able to generate mm -hmm. an, a, a, witness a witness of, of this formula with, in, in time which is not exhaustive search. Yeah, yeah. Is there a hope for such a theorem? That whenever you have a small description, there exists an yeah. algorithm that to, to, generates. To, 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 yeah. Sub-exponential yeah. time in the next. Yeah. No, no, that would be I mean, we incredible. Don't we don't know. Yeah, we don't know. Yes. Um, what? Isn't that P versus MP? No, because I, I add the small description. Right? You add the requirement that there is a small description. Maybe we should yeah. Yeah. The discussion. Uh, but yeah, so there's a very interesting question of for, for, for how many things can we do this? So and, and constant side description. Yeah, and, and what are the limits on it? Yeah. So okay, so so yeah, so I think you know that's you know this is you know I'm just conjecturing here that for for certain things and we've actually done work on sure numbers uh, and and some other work has been done from the word and numbers. So um, I think definitely in certain areas, but probably not in all, you, we can find these procedures. That's the conjecture. Um, um, so you know it's pushing going a little bit you know set solver equation. There's all these reasoning things. We want to move from the per instance base, where, where generally we stop when we find some solution for some size. We want to go and say, okay, what is the general structure of the solution space? Can we can we find, identify a subset that we can construct? Um, uh, new law about new algorithms. You know, we are sort of hoping that maybe we can find interesting new algorithms by by pushing this kind of you know uh, interactive design of a procedure. Um, and um, I think there's not much more. So, um, yeah, so as I said, we did some uh, sure numbers, uh, graceful grasp, you know, very strange combinatory objects, <laughs> but we, we, can, we can find them. Um, so overall, the work shows sort of this, this streamlining approach. So that's a different kind of approach to combinatorial search where you say, I can't, in no way I'm going to search, you know, 10 to the, 11 to the 60 binary subsequence uh, or these Latin squares of, of, of all uh, possible arrangements. We can't search the whole space. But I'm going to search in a subspace, a subspace that, that has some interesting structure. Uh, and we're seeing actually current SAT solvers, I find that quite interesting, are, are starting to use things like uh, satisfiability preserving uh, pr uh, steps, but not solution preserving. So they don't, uh, they don't keep exactly a set of solutions around. They just say, you know, if my previous, if my previous instance is satisfiable, I do a transformation that guarantees it's still satisfiable, if the previous one was. But they can have more uh, solutions, for example, or fewer solutions. Uh, and that's used right now during the, the search process, not just as a pre-processing, but even during the search process. So this, this is becoming more, more effective. Um, so informally streamlined restricts the most uh, promising, most uh, structured parts of the computer space, ideally uh, allows for much deeper searches. You, know, you can go much farther out. Uh, and, and we're starting to discover them automatically uh, in these sets. Okay, thanks. So we don't have questions. Okay, so. questions are really talk. Sure. Okay. Okay.